Book Eight, Chapter Six Three Human Hearts Differently Constructed. Phoebus was not dead, however. Men of that stamp die hard. When Master Philippe Lullier, advocate extraordinary of the King, had said to poor Esmeralda, He is dying, it was an error or a jest. When the archdeacon had repeated to the condemned girl, He is dead, the fact is that he knew nothing about it, but that he believed it, that he counted on it, that he did not doubt it, that he devoutly hoped it. It would have been too hard for him to give up favorable news of his rival to the woman whom he loved. Any man would have done the same in his place. It was not that Phoebus's wound had not been serious, but it had not been as much so as the archdeacon believed. The physician, to whom the soldiers of the watch had carried him at the first moment, had feared for his life during the space of a week, and had even told him so in Latin. But youth had gained the upper hand, and, as frequently happens, in spite of prognostications and diagnoses, nature had amused herself by saving the sick man under the physician's very nose. It was while he was still lying on the leech's pallet that he had submitted to the interrogations of Philippe Lullier and the official inquisitors, which had annoyed him greatly. Hence, one fine morning, feeling himself better, he had left his golden spurs with the leech as payment, and had slipped away. This had not, however, interfered with the progress of the affair. Justice, at that epoch, troubled itself very little about the clearness and definiteness of a criminal suit. Provided that the accused was hung, that was all that was necessary. Now the judge had plenty of proofs against La Esmeralda. They had supposed Phoebus to be dead, and that was the end of the matter. Phoebus, on his side, had not fled far. He had simply rejoined his company in garrison at Cue-en-Brie, in the Isle de France, a few stages from Paris. After all, it did not please him in the least to appear in this suit. He had a vague feeling that he should play a ridiculous figure in it. On the whole, he did not know what to think of the whole affair. Superstitious, and not given to devoutness, like every soldier who is only a soldier, when he came to question himself about this adventure, he did not feel assured as to the goat, as to the singular fashion in which he had met La Esmeralda, as to the no less strange manner in which she had allowed him to divine her love, as to her character as a gypsy, and lastly, as to the surly monk. He perceived in all these incidents much more magic than love, probably a sorceress, perhaps the devil. A comedy, in short, or to speak in the language of that day, a very disagreeable mystery, in which he played a very awkward part, the role of blows and derision. The captain was quite put out of countenance about it. He experienced that sort of shame which our La Fontaine has so admirably defined. Ashamed as a fox who has been caught by a fowl. Moreover, he hoped that the affair would not get noised abroad, that his name would hardly be pronounced in it, and that in any case it would not go beyond the courts of the Tournelle. In this he was not mistaken. There was then no Gazette de Tribunaux, and as not a week passed which had not its counterfeiter to boil, or its witch to hang, or its heretic to burn, at some one of the innumerable justices of Paris, people were so accustomed to seeing in all the squares of the ancient feudal Thamie, bare-armed, with sleeves stripped up, performing her duty at the gibbets, the ladders, and the pillories, that they hardly paid any heed to it. Fashionable society of that day hardly knew the name of the victim who passed by at the corner of the street, and it was the populace at the most who regaled themselves with this coarse fare. An execution was an habitual incident of the public highways, like the brazing pan of the baker, or the slaughterhouse of the knacker. 
The executioner was only a sort of butcher of a little deeper dye than the rest. Hence, Phoebus's mind was soon at ease on the score of the enchantress Esmeralda, or similar, as he called her, concerning the blow from the dagger of the Bohemian or of the surly monk, it mattered little which to him, and as to the issue of the trial. But as soon as his heart was vacant in that direction, Fleur de Lis returned to it. Captain Phoebus's heart, like the physics of that day, abhorred a vacuum. Q. Ambrie was a very insipid place to stay at then, a village of farriers, and cowgirls with chapped hands, a long line of poor dwellings and thatched cottages, which borders on the Grand Road on both sides for half a league. A tale, Q, in short, as its name imports. Fleur de Lis was his last passion but one, a pretty girl, a charming dowry. Accordingly, one fine morning, quite cured, and assuming that, after the lapse of two months, the Bohemian affair must be completely finished and forgotten, the amorous cavalier arrived on a prancing horse at the door of the Gondolorier mansion. He paid no attention to a tolerably numerous rabble which had assembled in the Place du Parvis before the portal of Notre Dame. He remembered that it was the month of May. He supposed that it was some procession, some Pentecost, some festival, hitched his horse to the ring at the door, and gaily ascended the stairs to his beautiful betrothed. She was alone with her mother. The scene of the witch, her goat, her cursed alphabet, and Phoebus's long absences still weighed on Fleur de Lise's heart. Nevertheless, when she beheld her captain enter, she thought him so handsome, his doublet so new, his baldric so shining, and his air so impassioned, that she blushed with pleasure. The noble damsel herself was more charming than ever. Her magnificent blonde hair was plaited in a ravishing manner. She was dressed entirely in that sky blue which becomes fair people so well, a bit of coquetry which she had learned from Cologne, and her eyes were swimming in that languor of love which becomes them still better. Phoebus, who had seen nothing in the line of beauty, since he left the village maids of Cue and Brie, was intoxicated with Fleur de Lis, which imparted to our officer so eager and gallant an air, that his peace was immediately made. Madame de Gondelaurier herself, still maternally seated in her big armchair, had not the heart to scold him. As for Fleur de Lise's reproaches, they expired in tender cooings. The young girl was seated near the window, still embroidering her grotto of Neptune. The captain was leaning over the back of her chair, and she was addressing her caressing reproaches to him in a low voice. What has become of you these two long months, wicked man?" "'I swear to you,' replied Phoebus, somewhat embarrassed by the question, "'that you are beautiful enough to set an archbishop to dreaming.' She could not repress a smile. "'Good, good sir, let my beauty alone, and answer my question. A fine beauty, in sooth.' "'Well, my dear cousin, I was recalled to the garrison. And where is that, if you please? And why did not you come to say farewell? At Cuan Brie. Phoebus was delighted with the first question, which helped him to avoid the second. But that is quite close by, monsieur. Why did you not come to see me a single time? Here Phoebus was rather seriously embarrassed. "'Because, the service, and then, charming cousin, I have been ill.' "'Ill?' she repeated in alarm. "'Yes, wounded.' "'Wounded?' She, poor child, was completely upset. "'Oh, do not be frightened at that,' said Phoebus, carelessly. "'It was nothing.' A quarrel, a sword-cut. What is that to you?" "'What is that to me?' exclaimed Fleur-de-Lis, raising her beautiful eyes filled with tears. 
Oh, you do not say what you think when you speak thus. What sword cut was that? I wish to know all. Well, my dear fair one, I had a falling out with Mahé Fadi, you know, the lieutenant of Saint Germain en Laye, and we ripped out a few inches of skin for each other. That is all. The mendacious captain was perfectly well aware that an affair of honor always makes a man stand well in the eyes of a woman. In fact, Fleur de Lis looked him full in the face, all agitated with fear, pleasure, and admiration. Still, she was not completely reassured. Provided that you are wholly cured, my Phoebus, said she, I do not know your Mae Fedi, but he is a villainous man. And whence arose this quarrel? Here Phoebus, whose imagination was endowed with but mediocre power of creation, began to find himself in a quandary as to a means of extricating himself for his prowess. Oh, how do I know? A mere nothing, a horse, a remark. Fair cousin, he exclaimed, for the sake of changing the conversation, what noise is this in the cathedral square? He approached the window. Oh, mon Dieu, fair cousin, how many people there are on the place? I know not, said Fleur de Lis. It appears that a witch is to do penance this morning before the church, and thereafter to be hung. The captain was so thoroughly persuaded that La Esmeralda's affair was concluded that he was but little disturbed by Fleur de Lis's words. Still, he asked her one or two questions. What is the name of this witch? I do not know, she replied. And what is she said to have done? She shrugged her white shoulders. I know not. Oh, mon Dieu, Jésus, said her mother, there are so many witches nowadays that I dare say they burn them without knowing their names. One might as well seek the name of every cloud in the sky. After all, one may be tranquil. The good God keeps his register. Here the venerable Dom rose and came to the window. Good Lord, you are right, Phoebus, said she. The rabble is indeed great. There are people on all the roofs, bless be God. Do you know, Phoebus, this reminds me of my best days. The entrance of King Charles the Seventh, when also there were many people. I no longer remember in what year that was. When I speak of this to you, it produces upon you the effect, does it not? The effect of something very old, and upon me of something very young. Oh, the crowd was far finer than at the present day. They even stood upon the maculations of the Porte Saint Antoine. The king had the queen on a pillion, and after their highnesses came all the ladies mounted behind all the lords. I remember that they laughed loudly, because, beside Emmanuel de Garland, who was very short of stature, there rode the Sieur Montefelon, a chevalier of gigantic size, who had killed heaps of English. It was very fine a procession of all the gentlemen of France, with their oriflamme waving red before the eye. There were some with pennons, and some with banners. How can I tell? The Sieur de Com with a pennon, Jean de Chaltmorant with a banner, the Sieur de Courcy with a banner, and a more ample one than any of the others, except the Duc de Bourbon. Alas! Tis a sad thing to think that all that has existed and exists no longer." The two lovers were not listening to the venerable dowager. Phoebus had returned and was leaning on the back of his betrothed's chair, a charming post whence his libertine glance plunged into all the openings of Fleur de Lise's gorget. This gorget gaped so conveniently, and allowed him to see so many exquisite things, and to divine so many more, that Phoebus, dazzled by this skin with its gleams of satin, said to himself, How can any one love anything but a fair skin? Both were silent. 
The young girl raised sweet and raptured eyes to him from time to time, and their hair mingled in a ray of spring sunshine. Phoebus, said Fleur de Lis suddenly, in a low voice, we are to be married three months hence. Swear to me that you have never loved any other woman than myself. I swear it, fair angel, replied Phoebus, and his passionate glances aided the sincere tone of his voice in convincing Fleur de Lis. Meanwhile, the good mother, charmed to see the betrothed pair on terms of such perfect understanding, had just quitted the apartment to attend to some domestic matter. Phoebus observed it, and this so emboldened the adventurous captain that very strange ideas mounted to his brain. Fleur de Lis loved him. He was her betrothed. She was alone with him. His former taste for her had reawakened, not with all its freshness, but with all its ardor. After all, there is no great harm in tasting one's wheat while it is still in the blade. I do not know whether these ideas passed through his mind, but one thing is certain, that Fleur de Lis was suddenly alarmed by the expression of his glance. She looked round and saw that her mother was no longer there. "'Good heavens!' said she, blushing and uneasy. How very warm I am!" "'I think, in fact,' replied Phoebus, "'that it cannot be far from midday. The sun is troublesome. We need only lower the curtains.' "'No, no!' exclaimed the poor little thing. "'On the contrary, I need air!' And, like a fawn who feels the breath of the pack of hounds, she rose, ran to the window, opened it, and rushed upon the balcony. Phoebus, much discomfited, followed her. The Place du Parvis Notre Dame, upon which the balcony looked, as the reader knows, presented at that moment a singular and sinister spectacle, which caused the fright of the timid fleur-de-lis to change its nature. An immense crowd, which overflowed into all the neighboring streets, encumbered the Place properly speaking. The little wall, breast-high, which surrounded the place, would not have sufficed to keep it free had it not been lined with a thick hedge of sergeants and huckpeteers, culverines in hand. Thanks to this thicket of pikes and arquebuses, the parvis was empty. Its entrance was guarded by a force of halberdiers, with the armorial bearings of the bishop. The large doors of the church were closed, and formed a contrast with the innumerable windows on the place, which, open to their very gables, allowed a view of thousands of heads heaped up almost like the piles of bullets in a park of artillery. The surface of this rabble was dingy, dirty, earthy. The spectacle which it was expecting was evidently one of the sort which possessed the privilege of bringing out and calling together the vilest among the populace. Nothing is so hideous as the noise which was made by that swarm of yellow caps and dirty heads. In that throng there were more laughs than cries, more women than men. From time to time a sharp and vibrating voice pierced the general clamor. Away, Mahie Balifre, is she to be hung yonder? Fool, tis here that she is to make her apology in her shift. The good God is going to cough Latin in her face. That is always done here at midday. If tis the gallows that you wish, go to the greve. I will go there afterwards. Tell me, La Boucambri, is it true that she has refused a confessor? It appears so, La Bachon. You see what a pagan she is. Tis the custom, monsieur. The bailiff of the courts is bound to deliver the malefactor ready judged for execution, if he be a layman, to the provost of Paris, if a clerk, to the official of the bishopric. Thank you, sir. Oh, God, said Fleur de Lis, the poor creature. This thought filled with sadness the glance which he cast upon the populace. The captain, much more occupied with her than with that pack of the rabble, 
was amorously rumpling her girdle behind. She turned round, entreating and smiling. "'Please let me alone, Phoebus. If my mother were to return, she would see your hand.' At that moment midday rang slowly out from the clock of Notre Dame. A murmur of satisfaction broke out in the crowd. The last vibration of the twelfth stroke had hardly died away when all heads surged like the waves beneath a squall, and an immense shout went up from the pavement, the windows, and the roofs. "'There she is!' Fleur de Lis pressed her hands to her eyes, that she might not see. "'Charming girl,' said Phoebus, "'do you wish to withdraw?' "'No,' she replied, and she opened through curiosity the eyes which she had closed through fear. A tumbrel, drawn by a stout Norman horse, and all surrounded by cavalry in violet livery with white crosses, had just debouched upon the place through the Rue Saint-Pierre aux Boeufs. The sergeants of the watch were clearing a passage for it through the crowd by stout blows from their clubs. Beside the cart rode several officers of justice and police recognizable by their black costume and their awkwardness in the saddle. Master Jacques Charmelou paraded at their head. In the fatal cart sat a young girl with her arms tied behind her back, and with no priest beside her. She was in her shift, her long black hair, the fashion then was to cut it off only at the foot of the gallows, fell in disorder upon her half-bared throat and shoulders. Athwart that waving hair, more glossy than the plumage of a raven, a thick, rough gray rope was visible, twisted and knotted, chafing her delicate collarbones, and twining round the charming neck of the poor girl, like an earthworm round a flower. Beneath that rope glittered a tiny amulet, ornamented with bits of green glass, which had been left to her, no doubt, because nothing is refused to those who are about to die. The spectators in the windows could see in the bottom of the cart her naked legs, which she strove to hide beneath her, as by a final feminine instinct. At her feet lay a little goat, bound. The condemned girl held together with her teeth her imperfectly fastened shift. One would have said that she suffered still more in her misery from being thus exposed almost naked to the eyes of all. Alas, modesty is not made for such shocks. Jesus," said Fleur de Lis hastily to the captain, "Look, fair cousin, tis that wretched Bohemian with the goat." So saying, she turned to Phoebus. His eyes were fixed on the tumbrel. He was very pale. "What Bohemian with the goat?" he stammered. "What?" resumed Fleur de Lis. "Do you not remember?" Phoebus interrupted her. "I do not know what you mean." He made a step to re-enter the room, but Fleur de Lis, whose jealousy, previously so vividly aroused by this same gypsy, had just been reawakened, Fleur de Lis gave him a look full of penetration and distrust. She vaguely recalled at that moment having heard of a captain mixed up in the trial of that witch. "'What is the matter with you?' she said to Phoebus. "'One would say that this woman had disturbed you.' Phoebus forced a sneer. Me? Not the least in the world. Ah, yes, certainly. Remain, then, she continued imperiously, and let us see the end. The unlucky captain was obliged to remain. He was somewhat reassured by the fact that the condemned girl never removed her eyes from the bottom of the cart. It was but too surely La Esmeralda. In this last stage of opprobrium and misfortune she was still beautiful. Her great black eyes appeared still larger, because of the emaciation of her cheeks. Her pale profile was pure and sublime. She resembled what she had been, in the same degree that a virgin by Masaccio resembles a virgin of Raphael, weaker, thinner, more delicate. Moreover, there was nothing in her which was not shaken in some sort, and which, with the exception of her modesty, she did not let go at will, so profoundly had she been broken by stupor and despair. Her body bounded at every jolt of the tumbrel, like a dead or broken thing. 
Her gaze was dull and imbecile. A tear was still visible in her eyes, but motionless and frozen, so to speak. Meanwhile, the lugubrious cavalcade has traversed the crowd, amid cries of joy and curious attitudes. But as a faithful historian, we must state that on beholding her so beautiful, so depressed, many were moved with pity, even among the hardest of them. The tumbrel had entered the parvis. It halted before the central portal. The escort ranged themselves in line on both sides. The crowd became silent and, in the midst of this silence, full of anxiety and solemnity, the two leaves of the grand door swung back, as of themselves, on their hinges, which gave a creak like the sound of a fife. Then there became visible in all its length the deep, gloomy church, hung in black, sparely lighted with a few candles gleaming afar off on the principal altar, opened in the midst of the place which was dazzling with light, like the mouth of a cavern. At the very extremity, in the gloom of the apse, a gigantic silver cross was visible against a black drapery, which hung from the vault to the pavement. The whole nave was deserted, but a few heads of priests could be seen moving confusedly in the distant choir-stalls, and at the moment when the great door opened there escaped from the church a loud, solemn, and monotonous chanting which cast over the head of the condemned girl, in gusts, fragments of melancholy psalms. Non time bo milia populae circumdantus me, exurge domine, solva mi fac deus. Salvo mi fac deus, coniam introverunt aquae esco ad animam miam. In faxa sum in limo profundi, et non es substantia. At the same time, another voice, separate from the choir, intoned upon the steps of the chief altar this melancholy offertory. Qui verbum meum audit, et credit e qui mesit me, hibet vitam oternam et injusticium, non venit said transit de morte im vitam. He that heareth my word, and believeth in him that sent me, hath eternal life, and hath not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. This chant, which a few old men buried in the gloom, sang from afar over that beautiful creature, full of youth and life, caressed by the warm air of spring, inundated with sunlight, was the mass for the dead the people listened devoutly. The unhappy girl seemed to lose her sight and her consciousness in the obscure interior of the church. Her white lips moved as though in prayer, and the headsman's assistant, who approached to assist her to alight from the cart, heard her repeating this word in a low tone, Phoebus. They untied her hands, made her alight, accompanied by her goat, which had also been unbound and which bleated with joy at finding itself free. And they made her walk barefoot on the hard pavement to the foot of the steps leading to the door. The rope about her neck trailed behind her. One would have said it was a serpent following her. Then the chanting in the church ceased. A great golden cross and a row of wax candles began to move through the gloom. The halberds of the motley beetles clanked, and a few moments later a long procession of priests in chasubles and deacons in dalmatics marched gravely towards the condemned girl, as they drawled their song, spread out before her view and that of the crowd. But her glance rested on the one who marched at the head, immediately after the cross-bearer. "'Oh,' she said in a low voice, and with a shudder, "'tis he again, the priest!' It was, in fact, the archdeacon. On his left he had the sub-chanter, on his right the chanter, armed with his official wand. He advanced with head thrown back, his eyes fixed and wide open, intoning in a strong voice, De ventre inferi clamavi, et exaudisti vocem miam, et projacisti me in profundum in cordemans, et flumem circumdidet me. 
Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about." At the moment when he made his appearance in the full daylight beneath the lofty arched portal, enveloped in an ample cope of silver barred with a black cross, he was so pale that more than one person in the crowd thought that one of the marble bishops who knelt on the sepulchral stones of the choir had risen and was come to receive upon the brink of the tomb the woman who was about to die. She, no less pale, no less like a statue, had hardly noticed that they had placed in her hand a heavy lighted candle of yellow wax. She had not heard the yelping voice of the clerk reading the fatal contents of the apology. When they told her to respond with Amen, she responded Amen. She only recovered life and force when she beheld the priest make a sign to her guards to withdraw, and himself advance alone towards her. Then she felt her blood boil in her head, and a remnant of indignation flashed up in that soul already benumbed and cold. The archdeacon approached her slowly. Even in that extremity she beheld him cast an eye sparkling with sensuality, jealousy, and desire, over her exposed form. Then he said aloud, "'Young girl, have you asked God's pardon for your faults and shortcomings?' He bent down to her ear, and added, the spectator supposed that he was receiving her last confession, "'Will you have me? I can still save you.' She looked intently at him. "'Begone, demon, or I will denounce you!' He gave vent to a horrible smile. "'You will not be believed. You will only add a scandal to a crime. Reply quickly. Will you have me?' "'What have you done with my Phoebus?' "'He is dead,' said the priest. At that moment the wretched archdeacon raised his head mechanically, and beheld at the other end of the place, in the balcony of the Gondolarier mansion, the captain standing beside Fleur de Lis. He staggered, passed his hand across his eyes, looked again, muttered a curse, and all his features were violently contorted. "'Well, die, then!' he hissed between his teeth. "'No one shall have you!' Then, raising his hand over the gypsy, he exclaimed in a funereal voice, "'E nunc anime anseps, et sit tibi Deus misenicors!' Go now, soul, trembling in the balance, and God have mercy upon thee." This was the dread formula with which it was the custom to conclude these gloomy ceremonies. It was the signal agreed upon between the priest and the executioner. The crowd knelt. Kyrie eleison, said the priests, who had remained beneath the arch of the portal. Lord have mercy upon us. Kyrie eleison, repeated the throng in that murmur which runs over all heads like the waves of a troubled sea. Amen, said the archdeacon. He turned his back to the condemned girl, his head sank upon his breast once more. He crossed his hands and rejoined his escort of priests, and a moment later he was seen to disappear, with the cross, the candles, and the copes, beneath the misty arches of the cathedral, and his sonorous voice was extinguished by degrees in the choir, as he chanted this verse of despair, Omnes gurgites tue et fluctos tue super me transeriunt. All thy waves and thy billows have gone over me. At the same time the intermittent clash of the iron butts of the beetles' halberds, gradually dying away among the columns of the nave, produced the effect of a clock-hammer striking the last hour of the condemned. The doors of Notre-Dame remained open, allowing a view of the empty, desolate church, draped in mourning, without candles and without voices. The condemned girl remained motionless in her place, waiting to be disposed of. One of the sergeants of police was obliged to notify Master Charmelou of the fact, as the latter, during this entire scene, had been engaged in studying the bas-relief of the grand portal, which represents, according to some, the sacrifice of Abraham, according to others, the philosopher's alchemical operation, the sun being figured forth by the angel, 
the fire by the faggot, the artisan by Abraham. There was considerable difficulty in drawing him away from that contemplation, but at length he turned round, and at a signal which he gave, two men, clad in yellow, the executioner's assistants, approached the gypsy to bind her hands once more. The unhappy creature, at the moment of mounting once again the fatal cart and proceeding to her last halting-place, was seized, possibly, with some poignant clinging to life. She raised her dry red eyes to heaven, to the sun, to the silvery clouds, cut here and there by a blue trapezium or triangle, then she lowered them to objects around her, to the earth, the throng, the houses. All at once, while the yellow man was binding her elbows, she uttered a terrible cry, a cry of joy. Yonder, on that balcony, at the corner of the place, she had just caught sight of him, of her friend, her lord, Phoebus, the other apparition of her life. The judge had lied, the priest had lied. It was certainly he, she could not doubt it. He was there, handsome, alive, dressed in his brilliant uniform, his plume on his head, his sword by his side. "'Phoebus!' she cried. "'My Phoebus!' and she tried to stretch toward him arms, trembling with love and rapture, but they were bound. Then she saw the captain frown, a beautiful young girl, who was leaning against him, gazed at him with disdainful lips and irritated eyes. Then Phoebus uttered some words which did not reach her, and both disappeared precipitately behind the window opening upon the balcony, which closed after them. Phoebus! she cried wildly. Can it be you believe it?" A monstrous thought had just presented itself to her. She remembered that she had been condemned to death for murder committed on the person of Phoebus de Chateaupay. She had borne up until that moment, but this last blow was too harsh. She fell lifeless on the pavement. "'Come,' said Charmeleu, "'carry her to the cart and make an end of it. No one had yet observed in the gallery of the statues of the kings, carved directly above the arches of the portal, a strange spectator, who had, up to that time, observed everything with such impassiveness, with a neck so strained, a visage so hideous, that in his motley accoutrement of red and violet he might have been taken for one of those stone monsters through whose mouths the long gutters of the cathedral have discharged their waters for six hundred years. This spectator had missed nothing that had taken place since midday, in front of the portal of Notre Dame. And at the very beginning he had securely fastened to one of the small columns a large knotted rope, one end of which trailed on the flight of steps below. This being done, he began to look on tranquilly, whistling from time to time when a blackbird flitted past. Suddenly, at the moment when the superintendent's assistants were preparing to execute Charmeleu's phlegmatic order, he threw his leg over the balustrade of the gallery, seized the rope with his feet, his knees and his hands. Then he was seen to glide down the façade, as a drop of rain slips down a window-pane, rushed to the two executioners with the swiftness of a cat which has fallen from a roof, knocked them down with two enormous fists pick up the gypsy with one hand, as a child would her doll, and dash back into the church with a single bound, lifting the young girl above his head, and crying in a formidable voice, SANCTUARY! This was done with such rapidity that, had it taken place at night, the whole of it could have been seen in the space of a single flash of lightning. SANCTUARY! SANCTUARY! repeated the crowd and the clapping of ten thousand hands made Quasimodo's single eye sparkle with joy and pride. This shock restored the condemned girl to her senses. She raised her eyelids, looked at Quasimodo, then closed them again suddenly, as though terrified by her deliverer. Charmeleu was stupefied, as well as the executioners and the entire escort. In fact, within the bounds of Notre Dame the condemned girl could not be touched the cathedral was a place of refuge. All temporal jurisdiction expired upon its threshold. Quasimodo had halted beneath the great portal, 
His huge feet seemed as solid on the pavement of the church as the heavy Roman pillars. His great, bushy head sat low between his shoulders, like the heads of lions, who also have a mane and no neck. He held the young girl, who was quivering all over, suspended from his horny hands like a white drapery. But he carried her with as much care as though he feared to break her or blight her. One would have said that he felt that she was a delicate, exquisite, precious thing, made for other hands than his. There were moments when he looked as if not daring to touch her, even with his breath. Then, all at once, he would press her forcibly in his arms, against his angular bosom, like his own possession, his treasure, as the mother of that child would have done. His gnome's eye, fastened upon her, inundated her with tenderness, sadness, and pity, and was suddenly raised filled with lightnings. Then the women laughed and wept, the crowd stamped with enthusiasm, for at that moment Quasimodo had a beauty of his own. He was handsome. He, that orphan, that foundling, that outcast. He felt himself august and strong. He gazed in the face of that society from which he was banished, and which he had so powerfully intervened, of that human justice from which he had wrenched its prey, of all those tigers whose jaws were forced to remain empty, of those policemen, those judges, those executioners, of all that force of the king which he, the meanest of creatures, had just broken with the force of God. And then it was touching to behold this protection which had fallen from a being so hideous upon a being so unhappy, a creature condemned to death saved by Quasimodo. They were two extremes of natural and social wretchedness, coming into contact and aiding each other. Meanwhile, after several moments of triumph, Quasimodo had plunged abruptly into the church with his burden. The populace, fond of all prowess, sought him with their eyes beneath the gloomy nave, regretting that he had so speedily disappeared from their acclamations. All at once he was seen to reappear at one of the extremities of the gallery of the kings of France. He traversed it, running like a madman, raising his conquest high in his arms and shouting, Sanctuary! The crowd broke forth, too, into fresh applause. The gallery passed, he plunged once more into the interior of the church. A moment later he reappeared upon the upper platform, with the gypsy still in his arms, still running madly, still crying, Sanctuary! And the throng applauded. Finally he made his appearance for the third time upon the summit of the tower, where hung the great bell. From that point he seemed to be showing to the entire city the girl whom he had saved, and his voice of thunder, that voice which was so rarely heard, and which he never heard himself, repeated thrice with frenzy, even to the clouds, Sanctuary! 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 Noel! Noel! shouted the populace in its turn and that immense acclamation flew to astonish the crowd assembled at the greve on the other bank, and the recluse who was still waiting with her eyes riveted on the gibbet. End of Book Eight, Chapter Six Chapter One of the Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Nine, Chapter One, Delirium. Claude Frollo was no longer in Notre Dame when his adopted son so abruptly cut the fatal web in which the archdeacon and the gypsy were entangled. On returning to the sacristy, he had torn off his alb, cope, and stole had flung all into the hands of the stupefied beetle, had made his escape through the private door of the cloister, had ordered a boatman of the terrain to transport him to the left bank of the Seine, and had plunged into the hilly streets of the university, not knowing whither he was going, encountering at every step groups of men and women who were hurrying joyously towards the Pont Saint-Michel, in the hope of still arriving in time to see the witch hung there 
pale, wild, more troubled, more blind and more fierce than a night-bird let loose and pursued by a troop of children in broad daylight. He no longer knew where he was, what he thought, or whether he was dreaming. He went forward, walking, running, taking any street at haphazard, making no choice, only urged ever onward away from the greve, the horrible greve, which he felt confusedly to be behind him. In this manner he skirted Mount saint Genevieve and finally emerged from the town by the Port saint Victor. He continued his flight as long as he could see, when he turned round, the turreted enclosure of the university and the rare houses of the suburb. But when at length a rise of ground had completely concealed from him that odious Paris, when he could believe himself to be a hundred leagues distant from it, in the fields, in the desert, he halted, and it seemed to him that he breathed more freely. Then frightful ideas thronged his mind. Once more he could see clearly into his soul, and he shuddered. He thought of that unhappy girl who had destroyed him, and whom he had destroyed. He cast a haggard eye over the double, tortuous way which fate had caused their two destinies to pursue up to their point of intersection, where it had dashed them against each other without mercy. He meditated on the folly of eternal vows, on the vanity of chastity, of science, of religion, of virtue, on the uselessness of God. He plunged to his heart's content in evil thoughts, and in proportion, as he sank deeper, he felt a satanic laugh burst forth within him. And as he thus sifted his soul to the bottom, when he perceived how large a space nature had prepared there for the passions, he sneered still more bitterly. He stirred up in the depths of his heart all his hatred, all his malevolence, and with the cold glance of a physician who examines a patient, he recognized the fact that this malevolence was nothing but vitiated love. That love, that source of every virtue in man, turned to horrible things in the heart of a priest, and that a man constituted like himself, in making himself a priest, made himself a demon. Then he laughed frightfully and suddenly became pale again, when he considered the most sinister side of his fatal passion, of that corrosive, venomous, malignant, implacable love, which had ended only in the gibbet for one of them and in hell for the other. Condemnation for her, damnation for him. And then his laughter came again, when he reflected that Phoebus was alive, that after all the captain lived, was gay and happy, had handsomer doublets than ever, and a new mistress whom he was conducting to see the old one hanged. His sneer redoubled its bitterness when he reflected that out of the living beings whose death he had desired, the gypsy, the only creature whom he did not hate, was the only one who had not escaped him. Then from the captain his thought passed to the people, and there came to him a jealousy of an unprecedented sort. He reflected that the people also, the entire populace, had had before their eyes the woman whom he loved exposed almost naked. He writhed his arms with agony as he thought that the woman whose form, caught by him alone in the darkness, would have been supreme happiness, had been delivered up in broad daylight at full noonday to a whole people, clad as for a night of voluptuousness. He wept with rage over all these mysteries of love, profaned, soiled, laid bare, withered forever. He wept with rage as he pictured to himself how many impure looks had been gratified at the sight of that badly fastened shift, and that this beautiful girl, this virgin lily, this cup of modesty and delight, to which he would have dared to place his lips only trembling had just been transformed into a sort of public bowl, whereat the vilest populace of Paris, thieves, beggars, lackeys, had come to quaff in common an audacious, impure, and depraved pleasure. And when he sought to picture to himself the happiness which he might have found upon earth if she had not been a gypsy, if he had not been a priest, if Phoebus had not existed, and if she had loved him, 
when he pictured to himself that a life of serenity and love would have been possible to him also, even to him, that there were at that very moment, here and there upon the earth, happy couples spending the hours in sweet converse beneath orange-trees, on the banks of brooks, in the presence of a setting sun, of a starry night. And that if God had so willed, he might have formed with her one of those blessed couples. His heart melted in tenderness and despair. Oh, she! Still she! It was this fixed idea which returned incessantly, which tortured him, which ate into his brain and rent his vitals. He did not regret, he did not repent. All that he had done he was ready to do again. He preferred to behold her in the hands of the executioner, rather than in the arms of the captain. But he suffered. He suffered so that at intervals he tore out handfuls of his hair to see whether it were not turning white. Among other moments there came one, when it occurred to him that it was perhaps the very minute when the hideous chain which he had seen that morning was pressing its iron noose closer about that frail and graceful neck. This thought caused the perspiration to start from every pore. There was another moment, when, while laughing diabolically at himself, he represented to himself La Esmeralda as he had seen her on that first day, lively, careless, joyous, gaily attired, dancing, winged, harmonious, and La Esmeralda of the last day, in her scanty shift, with a rope about her neck, mounting slowly with her bare feet the angular ladder of the gallows. He figured to himself this double picture in such a manner that he gave vent to a terrible cry. While this hurricane of despair overturned, broke, tore up, bent, uprooted everything in his soul, he gazed at nature around him. At his feet some chickens were searching the thickets and pecking, enameled beetles ran about in the sun. Overhead some groups of dappled gray clouds were floating across the blue sky. On the horizon the spire of the Abbey Saint-Victor pierced the ridge of the hill with its slate obelisk and the miller of the Capue hillock was whistling as he watched the laborious wings of his mill turning. All this active, organized, tranquil life, recurring around him under a thousand forms, hurt him. He resumed his flight. He sped thus across the fields until evening. This flight from nature, life, himself, man, God, everything, lasted all day long. Sometimes he flung himself face downward on the earth, and tore up the young blades of wheat with his nails. Sometimes he halted in the deserted street of a village, and his thoughts were so intolerable that he grasped his head in both hands and tried to tear it from his shoulders, in order to dash it upon the pavement. Towards the hour of sunset he examined himself again, and found himself nearly mad. The tempest which had raged within him ever since the instant when he had lost the hope and the will to save the gipsy, that tempest had not left in his conscience a single healthy idea, a single thought which maintained its upright position. His reason lay there almost entirely destroyed. There remained but two distinct images in his mind, La Esmeralda and the gallows. All the rest was blank. Those two images united present to him a frightful group, and the more he concentrated what attention and thought was left to him, the more he beheld them grow, in accordance with a fantastic progression, the one in grace, in charm, in beauty, in light, the other in deformity and horror. So that at last La Esmeralda appeared to him like a star, the gibbet like an enormous, fleshless arm. One remarkable fact is that during the whole of this torture the idea of dying did not seriously occur to him. The wretch was made so. He clung to life. Perhaps he really saw hell beyond it. Meanwhile the day continued to decline. The living being which still existed in him reflected vaguely on retracing its steps. He believed himself to be far away from Paris. 
On taking his bearings, he perceived that he had only circled the enclosure of the university. The spire of Saint Sulpice and the three lofty needles of Saint Germain des Prés rose above the horizon on his right. He turned his steps in that direction. When he heard the brisk challenge of the men at arms of the abbey, around the crenellated, circumscribing wall of Saint Germain, he turned aside, took a path which presented itself between the abbey and the Lazar house of the Bourg, and at the expiration of a few minutes found himself on the verge of the Pré aux Clairs. This meadow was celebrated by reason of the brawls which went on there day and night. It was the hydra of the poor monks of Saint Germain. Quod muaci sancti Germani pretensis hydra fuit, clericis nova semper dissidorum capita suscitantibus. The archdeacon was afraid of meeting someone there. He feared every human countenance. He had just avoided the university and the Bourg Saint Germain. He wished to re enter the streets as late as possible. He skirted the Pre aux Clairs, took the deserted path which separated it from the Dieu Neuf, and at last reached the water's edge. There Dom Claude found a boatman, who, for a few farthings in Parisian coinage, rode him up the Seine as far as the point of the city, and landed him on that tongue of abandoned land where the reader has already beheld Gringois dreaming, and which was prolonged beyond the king's gardens, parallel to the Ile du Passeur au Vacher. The monotonous rocking of the boat and the ripple of the water had, in some sort, quieted the unhappy Claude. When the boatman had taken his departure, he remained standing stupidly on the strand, staring straight before him and perceiving objects only through magnifying oscillations which rendered everything a sort of phantasmagoria to him. The fatigue of a great grief not infrequently produces this effect on the mind. The sun had set behind the lofty Tour de Nel. It was the twilight hour. The sky was white, the water of the river was white. Between these two white expanses the left bank of the Seine, on which his eyes were fixed, projected its gloomy mass, and rendered, ever thinner and thinner by perspective, it plunged into the gloom of the horizon like a black spire. It was loaded with houses, of which only the obscure outline could be distinguished, sharply brought out in shadows against the light background of the sky and the water. Here and there windows began to gleam, like the holes in a brazier. That immense black obelisk thus isolated between the two white expanses of the sky and the river, which was very broad at this point, produced upon Dom Claude a singular effect, comparable to that which could be experienced by a man who, reclining on his back at the foot of the Tower of Strasbourg, should gaze at the enormous spire plunging into the shadows of the twilight above his head. Only in this case it was Claude who was erect and the obelisk which was lying down. But as the river, reflecting the sky, prolonged the abyss below him, the immense promontory seemed to be as boldly launched into space as any cathedral spire, and the impression was the same. This impression had even one stronger and more profound point about it, that it was indeed the Tower of Strasbourg but the Tower of Strasbourg two leagues in height, something unheard of, gigantic, immeasurable, an edifice such as no human eye has ever seen, a Tower of Babel. The chimneys of the houses, the battlements of the walls, the faceted gables of the roofs, the spire of the Augustines, the Tower of Nell, all these projections which broke the profile of the colossal obelisk added to the illusion by displaying, in eccentric fashion to the eye, the indentations of a luxuriant and fantastic sculpture. Claude, in the state of hallucination in which he found himself, believed that he saw, that he saw with his actual eyes, the bell-tower of hell. The thousand lights scattered over the whole height of the terrible tower seemed to him so many porches of the immense interior furnace. The voices and noises which escaped from it seemed so many shrieks, so many death-groans. Then he became alarmed. He put his hands on his ears that he might no longer hear, turned his back that he might no longer see, and fled from the frightful vision with hasty strides. 
but the vision was in himself. When he re-entered the streets, the passers-by, elbowing each other by the light of the shop-fronts, produced upon him the effect of a constant going and coming of spectres about him. There were strange noises in his ears, extraordinary fancies disturbed his brain. He saw neither houses, nor pavements, nor chariots, nor men and women, but a chaos of indeterminate objects whose edges melted into each other. At the corner of the Rue de la Barillerie there was a grocer's shop whose porch was garnished all about, according to immemorial custom, with hoops of tin from which hung a circle of wooden candles, which came in contact with each other in the wind, and rattled like castanets. He thought he heard a cluster of skeletons at Montfaucon clashing together in the gloom. "'Oh,' he muttered, the night breeze dashes them against each other, and mingles the noise of their chains with the rattle of their bones. Perhaps she is there among them." In his state of frenzy he knew not whither he was going. After a few strides he found himself on the Pont Saint-Michel. There was a light in the window of a ground-floor room. He approached. Through a cracked window he beheld a mean chamber which recalled some confused memory to his mind. In that room, badly lighted by a meagre lamp, there was a fresh, light-haired young man with a merry face, who amid loud bursts of laughter was embracing a very audaciously attired young girl, and near the lamp sat an old crone spinning and singing in a quavering voice. As the young man did not laugh constantly, fragments of the old woman's ditty reached the priest. It was something unintelligible, yet frightful. Grève bois, grève grouille, fear, fear, ma grande fear ce cord à barreau qui siffle dans le pré Grève bois, grève grouille. La belle corde de chanvre sous mes désirs jusqu'à vendre, tout chanvre et non pas de bleu, le vol n'a pas volé, la belle corde de chanvre. Grève grouille, grève bois, pour voir le filet de joie. Prendre au gibet chez eux, les fenêtres sont des Grève grouille, grève bois. Bark grève, grumble grève, spin, spin, my distaff spin, her rope for the hangman, who is whistling in the meadow. What a beautiful hempen rope! So, hemp, not wheat, from Issy to Vanvre. The thief hath not stolen the beautiful hempen rope. Grumble grève, bark grève, to see the dissolute wench hang on the blear-eyed gibbet, windows are eyes. Thereupon the young man laughed and caressed the wench. The crone was La Falordel, the girl was a courtesan, the young man was his brother, Jehan. He continued to gaze. That spectacle was as good as any other. He saw Jehan go to a window at the end of the room open it, cast a glance on the quay, where in the distance blazed a thousand lighted casements, and he heard him say as he closed the sash, "'Pon my soul! How dark it is! The people are lighting their candles, and the good God his stars!' Then Jehan came back to the hag, smashed a bottle standing on the table, exclaiming, "'Already empty! Go boof! And I have no more money! Is a beau, my dear! I shall not be satisfied with Jupiter until he has changed your two white nipples into two black bottles, where I may suck wine of bone day and night." This fine pleasantry made the courtesan laugh, and Jehan left the room. Dom Claude had barely time to fling himself on the ground in order that he might not be met, stared in the face and recognized by his brother. Luckily the street was dark and the scholar was tipsy. Nevertheless he caught sight of the archdeacon prone upon the earth in the mud. "'Oh, oh!' said he. "'Here's a fellow who has been leading a jolly life to-day.' He stirred up Dom Claude with his foot, and the latter held his breath. "'Dead drunk,' resumed Jehan. "'Come, he's full. 
a regular leech detached from a hogshead. He's bald," he added, bending down. "'Tis an old man. Fortunate Sene." Then Dom Claude heard him retreat, saying, "'Tis all the same. Reason is a fine thing, and my brother the archdeacon is very happy in that he is wise and has money." Then the archdeacon rose to his feet and ran without halting towards Notre Dame, whose enormous towers he beheld rising above the houses through the gloom. At the instant when he arrived, panting on the Place de Parvis, he shrank back and dared not raise his eyes to the fatal edifice. "'Oh,' he said in a low voice, "'is it really true that such a thing took place here today, this very morning?' Still, he ventured to glance at the church. The front was somber. The sky behind was glittering with stars. The crescent of the moon, in her flight upward from the horizon, had paused at the moment on the summit of the right-hand tower, and seemed to have perched itself, like a luminous bird, on the edge of the balustrade cut out in black trefoils. The cloister door was shut but the archdeacon always carried with him the key of the tower in which his laboratory was situated. He made use of it to enter the church. In the church he found the gloom and silence of a cavern. By the deep shadows which fell in broad sheets from all directions he recognized the fact that the hangings of the ceremony of the morning had not yet been removed. The great silver cross shone from the depths of the gloom, powdered with some sparkling points, like the milky way of that sepulchral night. The long windows of the choir showed the upper extremities of their arches above the black draperies, and their painted panes, traversed by a ray of moonlight, had no longer any hues but the doubtful colors of night, a sort of violet, white and blue, whose tint is found only on the faces of the dead. The archdeacon, on perceiving these wan spots all around the choir, thought he beheld the mitres of damned bishops. He shut his eyes, and when he opened them again he thought they were a circle of pale visages gazing at him. He started to flee across the church. Then it seemed to him that the church also was shaking, moving, becoming endued with animation, that it was alive. That each of the great columns was turning into an enormous paw, which was beating the earth with its big stone spatula and that the gigantic cathedral was no longer anything but a sort of prodigious elephant, which was breathing and marching with its pillars for feet, its two towers for trunks, and the immense black cloth for its housings. This fever, or madness, had reached such a degree of intensity that the external world was no longer anything more for the unhappy man than a sort of apocalypse, visible, palpable, terrible. For one moment he was relieved. As he plunged into the side aisles, he perceived a reddish light behind a cluster of pillars. He ran towards it as to a star. It was the poor lamp which lighted the public breviary of Notre Dame night and day, beneath its iron grating. He flung himself eagerly upon the holy book in the hope of finding some consolation, or some encouragement there. The book lay open at this passage of Job over which his staring eye glanced. And a spirit passed before my face, and I heard a small voice, and the hair of my flesh stood up." On reading these gloomy words he felt that which a blind man feels when he feels himself pricked by the staff which he has picked up. His knees gave way beneath him, and he sank upon the pavement, thinking of her who had died that day. He felt so many monstrous vapors pass and discharge themselves in his brain that it seemed to him that his head had become one of the chimneys of hell. It would appear that he remained a long time in this attitude, no longer thinking, overwhelmed and passive beneath the hand of the demon. At length some strength returned to him. It occurred to him to take refuge in his tower beside his faithful Quasimodo. He rose, and as he was afraid, he took the lamp from the breviary to light his way. It was a sacrilege, but he had got beyond heeding such a trifle now. He slowly climbed the stairs of the towers, filled with a secret fright which must have been communicated to the rare passers-by in the Place du Parvis by the mysterious light of his lamp, mounting so late from loophole to loophole of the bell-tower. 
All at once he felt a freshness on his face, and found himself at the door of the highest gallery. The air was cold, the sky was filled with hurrying clouds, whose large white flakes drifted one upon another like the breaking up of river ice after the winter. The crescent of the moon, stranded in the midst of the clouds, seemed a celestial vessel caught in the ice-cakes of the air. He lowered his gaze, and contemplated for a moment, through the railing of slender columns which unites the two towers, far away, through a gauze of mists and smoke, the silent throng of the roofs of Paris, pointed, innumerable, crowded and small like the waves of a tranquil sea on a summer night. The moon cast a feeble ray, which imparted to earth and heaven an ashy hue. At that moment the clock raised its shrill, cracked voice. Midnight rang out. The priest thought of midday. Twelve o'clock had come back again. "'Oh,' he said in a very low tone, "'she must be cold now.' All at once a gust of wind extinguished his lamp, and almost at the same instant he beheld a shade, a whiteness, a form, a woman, appear from the opposite angle of the tower. He started. Beside this woman was a little goat, which mingled its bleat with the last bleat of the clock. He had strength enough to look. It was she. She was pale, she was gloomy. Her hair fell over her shoulders as in the morning but there was no longer a rope on her neck, her hands were no longer bound. She was free, she was dead. She was dressed in white and had a white veil on her head. She came towards him, slowly, with her gaze fixed on the sky. The supernatural goat followed her. He felt as though made of stone and too heavy to flee. At every step which she took in advance he took one backwards, and that was all. In this way he retreated once more beneath the gloomy arch of the stairway. He was chilled by the thought that she might enter there also. Had she done so, he would have died of terror. She did arrive, in fact, in front of the door to the stairway, and paused there for several minutes, stared intently into the darkness, but without appearing to see the priest, and passed on. She seemed taller to him than when she had been alive. He saw the moon through her white robe, he heard her breath. When she had passed on, he began to descend the staircase again, with the slowness which he had observed in the spectre, believing himself to be a spectre too, haggard, with hair on end, his extinguished lamp still in his hand. And as he descended the spiral steps, he distinctly heard in his ear a voice laughing and repeating, a spirit passed before my face, and I heard a small voice, and the hair of my flesh stood up. End of Book Nine, Chapter One Two of The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Nine, Chapter Two hunchbacked, one-eyed, lame. Every city during the Middle Ages, and every city in France down to the time of Louis the Twelfth, had its places of asylum. These sanctuaries, in the midst of the deluge of penal and barbarous jurisdictions which inundated the city, were a species of islands which rose above the level of human justice. Every criminal who landed there was safe. There were in every suburb almost as many places of asylum as gallows. It was the abuse of impunity by the side of the abuse of punishment, two bad things which strove to correct each other. The palaces of the king, the hotels of the princes, and especially churches, possessed the right of asylum. Sometimes a whole city which stood in need of being repeopled was temporarily created a place of refuge. Louis XI made all Paris a refuge in 1467. His foot once within the asylum, the criminal was sacred. But he must beware of leaving it. One step outside the sanctuary, and he fell back into the flood. The wheel, the gibbet, the strapado, kept good guard around the place of refuge, and lay in watch incessantly for their prey, like sharks around a vessel. 
Hence condemned men were to be seen whose hair had grown white in a cloister, on the steps of a palace, in the enclosure of an abbey, beneath the porch of a church. In this manner the asylum was a prison as much as any other. It sometimes happened that a solemn decree of Parliament violated the asylum and restored the condemned man to the executioner. But this was of rare occurrence. Parliaments were afraid of the bishops, and when there was friction between these two robes, the gown had but a poor chance against the cassock. Sometimes, however, as in the affair of the assassins of Petit Jean, the headsman of Paris, and in that of Emery Rousseau, the murderer of Jean Valeray, justice overleaped the church and passed on to the execution of its sentences. But unless by virtue of a decree of Parliament, woe to him who violated a place of asylum with armed force. The reader knows the manner of death of Robert de Clermont, Marshal of France, and of Jean de Chalon, Marshal of Champagne. And yet the question was only of a certain Perrin Marc, the clerk of a money-changer, a miserable assassin. But the two marshals had broken the doors of Saint marie Therein lay the enormity. Such respect was cherished for places of refuge that, according to tradition, animals even felt it at times. Emois relates that a stag, being chased by Dagobert, having taken refuge near the tomb of Saint-Denis, the pack of hounds stopped short and barked. Churches generally had a small apartment prepared for the reception of supplicants. In 1407 Nicolas Flamel caused to be built on the vaults of Saint-Jacques de la Boucherie a chamber which cost him four livres, six sous, sixteen farthings parisis. At Notre-Dame it was a tiny cell, situated on the roof of the side aisle, beneath the flying buttresses, precisely at the spot where the wife of the present janitor of the towers has made for herself a garden, which is to the hanging gardens of Babylon what a lettuce is to a palm-tree, what a porter's wife is to a semiramis. It was here that Quasimodo had deposited La Esmeralda, after his wild and triumphant course. As long as that course lasted, the young girl had been unable to recover her senses, half unconscious, half awake, no longer feeling anything, except that she was mounting through the air, floating in it, flying in it, that something was raising her above the earth. From time to time she heard the loud laughter, the noisy voice of Quasimodo in her ear. She half opened her eyes then below her she confusedly beheld Paris checkered with its thousand roofs of slate and tiles, like a red and blue mosaic, above her head the frightful and joyous face of Quasimodo. Then her eyelids drooped again. She thought that all was over, that they had executed her during her swoon, and that the misshapen spirit which had presided over her destiny had laid hold of her and was bearing her away. She dared not look at him, and she surrendered herself to her fate. But when the bell-ringer, disheveled and panting, had deposited her in the cell of refuge, when she felt his huge hands gently detaching the cord which bruised her arms, she felt that sort of shock which awakens with a start the passengers of a vessel which runs aground in the middle of a dark night. Her thoughts awoke also, and returned to her one by one. She saw that she was in Notre-Dame, she remembered having been torn from the hands of the executioner, that Phoebus was alive, that Phoebus loved her no longer, and as these two ideas, one of which shed so much bitterness over the other, presented themselves simultaneously to the poor condemned girl, she turned to Quasimodo, who was standing in front of her, and who terrified her. She said to him, "'Why have you saved me?' He gazed at her with anxiety, as though seeking to divine what she was saying to him. She repeated her question. Then he gave her a profoundly sorrowful glance and fled. She was astonished. A few moments later he returned, bearing a package which he cast at her feet. It was clothing which some charitable women had left on the threshold of the church for her. Then she dropped her eyes upon herself and saw that she was almost naked, and blushed. Life had returned. 
Quasimodo appeared to experience something of this modesty. He covered his eyes with his large hand and retired once more, but slowly. She made haste to dress herself. The robe was a white one with a white veil, the garb of a novice of the Hôtel Dian. She had barely finished when she beheld Quasimodo returning. He carried a basket under one arm and a mattress under the other. In the basket there was a bottle, bread, and some provisions. He set the basket on the floor and said, Eat! He spread the mattress on the flagging and said, Sleep! It was his own repast, it was his own bed, which the bell-ringer had gone in search of. The gypsy raised her eyes to thank him, but she could not articulate a word. She dropped her head with a quiver of terror. Then he said to her, I frighten you. I am very ugly, am I not? Do not look at me, only listen to me. During the day you will remain here, at night you can walk all over the church. But do not leave the church either by day or by night. You would be lost. They would kill you, and I should die." She was touched and raised her head to answer him. He had disappeared. She found herself alone once more, meditating upon the singular words of this almost monstrous being, and struck by the sound of his voice, which was so hoarse, yet so gentle. Then she examined her cell. It was a chamber about six feet square, with a small window and a door on the slightly sloping plane of the roof formed of flat stones. Many gutters with the figures of animals seemed to be bending down around her, and stretching their necks in order to stare at her through the window. Over the edge of her roof she perceived the tops of thousands of chimneys which caused the smoke of all the fires in Paris to rise beneath her eyes. A sad sight for the poor gypsy, a foundling, condemned to death, an unhappy creature, without country, without family, without a hearthstone. At the moment when the thought of her isolation thus appeared to her more poignant than ever, she felt a bearded and hairy head glide between her hands, upon her knees. She started. Everything alarmed her now, and looked. It was the poor goat, the agile jolly, which had made its escape after her at the moment when Quasimodo had put to flight Charmeleau's brigade, and which had been lavishing caresses on her feet for nearly an hour past, without being able to win a glance. The gypsy covered him with kisses. "'Oh, jolly!' she said. "'How I have forgotten thee! And so thou still thinkest of me! Oh, thou art not an ingrate!' At the same time, as though an invisible hand had lifted the weight which had repressed her tears in her heart for so long, she began to weep, and in proportion, as her tears flowed, she felt all that was most acrid and bitter in her grief depart with them. Evening came. She thought the night so beautiful that she made the circuit of the elevated gallery which surrounds the church. It afforded her some relief. So calm did the earth appear when viewed from that height. End of Book Nine, Chapter Two. Nine, Chapter Three of The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Nine, Chapter Three. Deaf. On the following morning she perceived on awaking that she had been asleep. This singular thing astonished her. She had been so long unaccustomed to sleep. A joyous ray of the rising sun entered through her window and touched her face. At the same time, with the sun, she beheld at the window an object which frightened her, the unfortunate face of Quasimodo. She involuntarily closed her eyes again, but in vain. She fancied that she still saw through the rosy lids that gnome's mask, one-eyed and gap-toothed. Then, while she still kept her eyes closed, she heard a rough voice saying, very gently, "'Be not afraid. I am no friend. I came to watch you sleep. It does not hurt you if I come to see you sleep, does it? What difference does it make to you if I am here when your eyes are closed?' Now I am going. Stay, I have placed myself behind the wall. You can open your eyes again. 
There was something more plaintive than these words, and that was the accent in which they were uttered. The gypsy, much touched, opened her eyes. He was, in fact, no longer at the window. She approached the opening and beheld the poor hunchback crouching in an angle of the wall, in a sad and resigned attitude. She made an effort to surmount the repugnance with which he inspired her. Come, she said to him gently. From the movement of the gypsy's lips, Quasimodo thought that she was driving him away. Then he rose and retired limping, slowly, with drooping head, without even daring to raise to the young girl his gaze full of despair. "'Do come!' she cried, but he continued to retreat. Then she darted from her cell, ran to him, and grasped his arm. On feeling her touch him, Quasimodo trembled in every limb. He raised his suppliant eye, and seeing that she was leading him back to her quarters, his whole face beamed with joy and tenderness. She tried to make him enter the cell, but he persisted in remaining on the threshold. "'No, no,' said he, "'the owl enters not the nest of the lark.' Then she crouched down gracefully on her couch, with her goat asleep at her feet. Both remained motionless for several moments, considering in silence, she so much grace, he so much ugliness. Every moment she discovered some fresh deformity in Quasimodo. Her glance travelled from his knocked knees to his humped back, from his humped back to his only eye. She could not comprehend the existence of a being so awkwardly fashioned. Yet there was so much sadness and so much gentleness spread over all this that she began to become reconciled to it. He was the first to break the silence. So. You were telling me to return?" She made an affirmative sign of the head, and said, Yes. He understood the motion of the head. Alas, he said, as though hesitating whether to finish, I am, I am deaf. Poor man! exclaimed the Bohemian, with an expression of kindly pity. He began to smile sadly. You think? that that was all that I lacked, do you not? Yes, I am deaf, that is the way I am made. Tis horrible, is it not? You are so beautiful." There lay in the accents of the wretched man so profound a consciousness of his misery that she had not the strength to say a word. Besides, he would not have heard her. He went on. Never have I seen my ugliness as at the present moment. When I compare myself to you, I feel a very great pity for myself, poor unhappy monster that I am. Tell me, I must look to you like a beast. You are a ray of sunshine, a drop of dew, the song of a bird. I am something frightful, neither man nor animal, I know not what harder, more trampled underfoot, more unshapely than a pebble-stone." Then he began to laugh, and that laugh was the most heart-breaking thing in the world. He continued, "'Yes, I am deaf, but you shall talk to me by gestures, by signs. I have a master who talks with me in that way. And then I shall very soon know your wish from the movement of your lips, from your look. Well, she interposed with a smile, tell me why you saved me. He watched her attentively while she was speaking. I understand, he replied. You ask me why I saved you. You have forgotten a wretch who tried to abduct you one night, a wretch to whom you rendered succor on the following day on their infamous pillory a drop of water and a little pity, that is more than I can repay with my life. You have forgotten that wretch, but he remembers it." She listened to him with profound tenderness. A tear swam in the eye of the bell-ringer, but did not fall. He seemed to make it a sort of point of honour to retain it. 
Listen, he resumed, when he was no longer afraid that the tear would escape. Our towers here are very high. A man who should fall from them would be dead before touching the pavement. When it shall please you to have me fall, you will not have to utter even a word. A glance will suffice." Then he rose. Unhappy as was the Bohemian, this eccentric being still aroused some compassion in her. She made him a sign to remain. "'No, no,' said he, "'I must not remain too long. I am not at my ease. It is out of pity that you do not turn away your eyes. I shall go to some place where I can see you without your seeing me. It will be better so.' He drew from his pocket a little metal whistle. "'Here,' said he, "'when you have need of me, when you wish me to come, when you will not feel too ranch horror at the sight of me, use this whistle. I can hear it sound.' He laid the whistle on the floor and fled. End of Book Nine, Chapter Three Chapter Four of The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Nine, Chapter Four Earthenware and Crystal. Day followed day. Calm gradually returned to the soul of La Esmeralda. Excess of grief, like excess of joy, is a violent thing which lasts but a short time. The heart of man cannot remain long in one extremity. The gypsy had suffered so much that nothing was left her but astonishment. With security, hope had returned to her. She was outside the pale of society, outside the pale of life, but she had a vague feeling that it might not be impossible to return to it. She was like a dead person, who should hold in reserve the key to her tomb. She felt the terrible images which had so long persecuted her gradually departing. All the hideous phantoms, Pierrat Tortureau, Jacques Charmelou, were effaced from her mind, all, even the priest. And then Phoebus was alive, she was sure of it, she had seen him. To her the fact of Phoebus being alive was everything. After the series of fatal shocks which had overturned everything within her, she had found but one thing intact in her soul, one sentiment, her love for the captain. Love is like a tree. It sprouts forth of itself, sends its roots out deeply through our whole being, and often continues to flourish greenly over a heart in ruins. And the inexplicable point about it is that the more blind is this passion, the more tenacious it is. It is never more solid than when it has no reason in it. La Esmeralda did not think of the captain without bitterness, no doubt. No doubt it was terrible that he also should have been deceived, that he should have believed that impossible thing, that he could have conceived of a stab dealt by her who would have given a thousand lives for him. But after all, she must not be too angry with him for it. Had she not confessed her crime? Had she not yielded, weak woman that she was, to torture? The fault was entirely hers. She should have allowed her fingernails to be torn out, rather than such a word to be wrenched from her. In short, if she could but see Phoebus once more, for a single minute, only one word would be required, one look, in order to undeceive him, to bring him back. She did not doubt it. She was astonished also at many singular things, at the accident of Phoebus's presence on the day of the penance, at the young girl with whom he had been. She was his sister, no doubt. An unreasonable explanation, but she contented herself with it, because she needed to believe that Phoebus still loved her, and loved her alone. Had he not sworn it to her? What more was needed? simple and credulous as she was. And then, in this matter, were not appearances much more against her than against him? Accordingly, she waited. She hoped. Let us add that the church, that vast church, 
which surrounded her on every side, which guarded her, which saved her, was itself a sovereign tranquilizer. The solemn lines of that architecture, the religious attitude of all the objects which surrounded the young girl, the serene and pious thoughts which emanated, so to speak, from all the pores of that stone, acted upon her without being aware of it. The edifice had also sounds fraught with such benediction and such majesty that they soothed this ailing soul. The monotonous chanting of the celebrants, the responses of the people to the priest, sometimes inarticulate, sometimes thunderous, the harmonious trembling of the painted windows, the organ bursting forth like a hundred trumpets, the three belfries humming like hives of huge bees, that whole orchestra on which bounded a gigantic scale, ascending, descending incessantly from the voice of a throng to that of one bell, dulled her memory, her imagination, her grief. The bells in particular lulled her. It was something like a powerful magnetism which those vast instruments shed over her in great waves. Thus every sunrise found her more calm, breathing better, less pale. In proportion as her inward wounds closed, her grace and beauty blossomed once more on her countenance, but more thoughtful, more reposeful. Her former character also returned to her, somewhat even of her gaiety, her pretty pout, her love for her goat, her love for singing, her modesty. She took care to dress herself in the morning, in the corner of her cell, for fear some inhabitants of the neighboring attics might see her through the window. When the thought of Phoebus left her time, the gypsy sometimes thought of Quasimodo. He was the sole bond, the sole connection, the sole communication which remained to her with men, with the living. Unfortunate girl! She was more outside the world than Quasimodo. She understood not in the least the strange friend whom chance had given her. She often reproached herself for not feeling a gratitude which should close her eyes, but decidedly she could not accustom herself to the poor bell-ringer. He was too ugly. She had left the whistle which he had given her lying on the ground. This did not prevent Quasimodo from making his appearance from time to time during the first few days. She did her best not to turn aside with too much repugnance when he came to bring her her basket of provisions or her jug of water, but he always perceived the slightest movement of this sort, and then he withdrew sadly. Once he came at the moment when she was caressing Jolly. He stood pensively for several minutes before this graceful group of the goat and the gypsy. At last he said, shaking his heavy and ill-formed head, "'My misfortune is that I still resemble a man too much. I should like to be wholly a beast like that goat." She gazed at him in amazement. He replied to the glance, "'Oh, I well know why,' and he went away. On another occasion he presented himself at the door of the cell, which he never entered, at the moment when La Esmeralda was singing an old Spanish ballad, the words of which she did not understand but which had lingered in her ear because the gypsy women had lulled her to sleep with it when she was a little child. At the sight of that villainous form which made its appearance so abruptly in the middle of her song, the young girl paused with an involuntary gesture of alarm. The unhappy bell-ringer fell upon his knees on the threshold, and clasped his large, misshapen hands with a suppliant air. "'Oh!' he said sorrowfully, "'Continue!' I implore you, and do not drive me away." She did not wish to pain him, and resumed her lay, trembling all over. By degrees, however, her terror disappeared, and she yielded herself wholly to the slow and melancholy air which she was singing. He remained on his knees, with hands clasped, as in prayer, attentive, hardly breathing his gaze riveted upon the gypsy's brilliant eyes. On another occasion he came to her with an awkward and timid air. "'Listen,' he said, with an effort, "'I have something to say to you.' She made him a sign that she was listening. 
Then he began to sigh, half opened his lips, appeared for a moment to be on the point of speaking. Then he looked at her again, shook his head, and withdrew slowly, with his brow in his hand, leaving the gypsy stupefied. Among the grotesque personages sculptured on the wall, there was one to whom he was particularly attached, and with which he often seemed to exchange fraternal glances. Once the gypsy heard him saying to it, "'Oh, why am not I of stone like you?' At last, one morning, La Esmeralda had advanced to the edge of the roof, and was looking into the place over the pointed roof of St. Jean le Rond. Quasimodo was standing behind her. He had placed himself in that position in order to spare the young girl, as far as possible, the displeasure of seeing him. All at once the gypsy started. A tear and a flash of joy gleamed simultaneously in her eyes. She knelt on the brink of the roof, and extended her arms towards the place with anguish, exclaiming, "'Phoebus! Come! Come! A word! A single word in the name of heaven! Phoebus! Phoebus!' Her voice, her face, her gesture, her whole person, bore the heart-rending expression of a shipwrecked man who is making a signal of distress to the joyous vessel which is passing afar off in a ray of sunlight on the horizon. Quasimodo leaned over the place and saw that the object of this tender and agonizing prayer was a young man, a captain, a handsome cavalier, all glittering with arms and decorations, prancing across the end of the place and saluting with his plume a beautiful lady who was smiling at him from her balcony. However, the officer did not hear the unhappy girl calling him. He was too far away. But the poor deaf man heard. A profound sigh heaved his breast. He turned round. His heart was swollen with all the tears which he was swallowing. His convulsively clenched fists struck against his head, and when he withdrew them there was a bunch of red hair in each hand. The gypsy paid no heed to him. He said, in a low voice, as he gnashed his teeth, "'Damnation! That is what one should be like! Tis only necessary to be handsome on the outside!' Meanwhile she remained kneeling, and cried with extraordinary agitation, "'Oh, there he is, alighting from his horse! He is about to enter that house! Phoebus! He does not hear me! Phoebus!' How wicked that woman is to speak to him at the same time with me! Phoebus! Phoebus!" The deaf man gazed at her. He understood this pantomime. The poor bell-ringer's eye filled with tears, but he let none fall. All at once he pulled her gently by the border of her sleeve. She turned round. He had assumed a tranquil air. He said to her, would you like to have me bring him to you?" She uttered a cry of joy. "'Oh, go, hasten, run, quick! That captain, that captain, bring him to me! I will love you for it!' She clasped his knees. He could not refrain from shaking his head sadly. "'I will bring him to you,' he said in a weak voice. Then he turned his head and plunged down the staircase with great strides stifling with sobs. When he reached the place he no longer saw anything except the handsome horse hitched at the door of the gondolier house. The captain had just entered there. He raised his eyes to the roof of the church. La Esmeralda was there in the same spot, in the same attitude. He made her a sad sign with his head. Then he planted his back against one of the stone posts of the gondolier porch determined to wait until the captain should come forth. In the gondolier house it was one of those gala days which precede a wedding. Quasimodo beheld many people enter, but no one come out. He cast a glance towards the roof from time to time. The gypsy did not stir any more than himself. A groom came and unhitched the horse and led it to the stable of the house. The entire day passed thus, Quasimodo at his post, La Esmeralda on the roof, 
Phoebus, no doubt, at the feet of Fleur de Lis. At length night came, a moonless night, a dark night. Quasimodo fixed his gaze in vain upon La Esmeralda. Soon she was no more than a whiteness amid the twilight. Then nothing. All was effaced, all was black. Quasimodo beheld the front windows from top to bottom of the Gondolaria mansion illuminated. He saw the other casements in the place lighted one by one. He also saw them extinguished to the very last, for he remained the whole evening at his post. The officer did not come forth. When the last passers-by had returned home, when the windows of all the other houses were extinguished, Quasimodo was left entirely alone, entirely in the dark. There were at that time no lamps in the square before Notre Dame. Meanwhile the windows of the Gondolarier mansion remained lighted, even after midnight. Quasimodo, motionless and attentive, beheld a throng of lively, dancing shadows pass athwart the many-colored painted panes. Had he not been deaf, he would have heard more and more distinctly, in proportion as the noise of sleeping Paris died away, a sound of feasting, laughter, and music in the Gondolarier mansion. Towards one o'clock in the morning the guests began to take their leave. Quasimodo, shrouded in darkness, watched them all pass out through the porch illuminated with torches. None of them was the captain. He was filled with sad thoughts. At times he looked upwards into the air, like a person who is weary of waiting. Great black clouds, heavy, torn, split, hung like crepe hammocks beneath the starry dome of night. One would have pronounced them spiders' webs of the vault of heaven. In one of these moments he suddenly beheld the long window on the balcony, whose stone balustrade projected above his head, open mysteriously. The frail glass door gave passage to two persons, and closed noiselessly behind them. It was a man and a woman. It was not without difficulty that Quasimodo succeeded in recognizing in the man the handsome captain in the woman the young lady whom he had seen welcome the officer in the morning from that very balcony. The place was perfectly dark, and a double crimson curtain which had fallen across the door the very moment it closed again allowed no light to reach the balcony from the apartment. The young man and the young girl, so far as our deaf man could judge, without hearing a single one of their words, appeared to abandon themselves to a very tender tete-a-tete. The young girl seemed to have allowed the officer to make a girdle for her of his arm, and gently repulsed a kiss. Quasimodo looked on from below at this scene which was all the more pleasing to witness, because it was not meant to be seen. He contemplated with bitterness that beauty, that happiness. After all, nature was not dumb in the poor fellow, and his human sensibility, all maliciously contorted as it was, quivered no less than any other. He thought of the miserable portion which Providence had allotted to him. That woman and the pleasure of love would pass forever before his eyes, and that he should never do anything but behold the felicity of others. But that which rent his heart most in this sight, that which mingled indignation with his anger, was the thought of what the gypsy would suffer could she behold it. It is true that the night was very dark, that La Esmeralda, if she had remained at her post, and he had no doubt of this, was very far away, and that it was all that he himself could do to distinguish the lovers on the balcony. This consoled him. Meanwhile their conversation grew more and more animated. The young lady appeared to be entreating the officer to ask nothing more of her. Of all this Quasimodo could distinguish only the beautiful clasped hands, the smiles mingled with tears, the young girl's glances directed to the stars, the eyes of the captain lowered ardently upon her. Fortunately, for the young girl was beginning to resist but feebly, the door of the balcony suddenly opened once more and an old dame appeared. The beauty seemed confused, the officer assumed an air of displeasure, and all three withdrew. A moment later a horse was champing his bit under the porch and the brilliant officer, enveloped in his night-cloak, passed rapidly before Quasimodo. 
The bell-ringer allowed him to turn the corner of the street, then he ran after him with his ape-like agility, shouting, "'Hey there! Captain!' The captain halted. "'What wants this knave with me?' he said, catching sight through the gloom of that hip-shot form which ran limping after him. Meanwhile Quasimodo had caught up with him, and had boldly grasped his horse's bridle. "'Follow me, captain. There is one here who desires to speak with you.' "'Corne meom,' grumbled Phoebus. "'Here's a villainous ruffled bird, which I fancy I have seen somewhere. Hola, master, will you let my horse's bridle alone?' Captain, replied the deaf man, do not ask me who it is. I tell you to release my horse, retorted Phoebus impatiently. What means the knave by clinging to the bridle of my steed? Do you take my horse for a gallows? Quasimodo, far from releasing the bridle, prepared to force him to retrace his steps. Unable to comprehend the captain's resistance, he hastened to say to him, Come, captain! "'Tis a woman who is waiting for you,' he added with an effort. "'A woman who loves you.' "'A rare rascal,' said the captain, "'who thinks me obliged to go to all the women who love me, or say they do. And what if, by chance, she should resemble you, you face of a screech-owl? Tell the woman who has sent you that I am about to marry, and that she may go to the devil.' Listen exclaimed Quasimodo, thinking to overcome his hesitation with a word. "'Come, Monsignor, tis the gypsy whom you know.' This word did indeed produce a great effect on Phoebus, but not of the kind which the deaf man expected. It will be remembered that our gallant officer had retired with fleur-de-lis several moments before Quasimodo had rescued the condemned girl from the hands of Charmelou. Afterwards, in all his visits to the Gondolarier mansion, he had taken care not to mention that woman, the memory of whom was, after all, painful to him. And on her side, Fleur-de-Lis had not deemed it politic to tell him that the gypsy was alive. Hence, Phoebus believed poor Similar to be dead, and that a month or two had elapsed since her death. Let us add, that for the last few moments the captain had been reflecting on the profound darkness of the night, the supernatural ugliness, the sepulchral voice of the strange messenger, that it was past midnight, that the street was deserted, as on the evening when the surly monk had accosted him, and that his horse snorted as it looked at Quasimodo. "'The gypsy!' he exclaimed, almost frightened. "'Look here!' Do you come from the other world?" And he laid his hand on the hilt of his dagger. "'Quick! Quick!' said the deaf man, endeavoring to drag the horse along. "'This way!' Phoebus dealt him a vigorous kick in the breast. Quasimodo's eye flashed. He made a motion to fling himself on the captain. Then he drew himself up stiffly, and said, "'Oh, how happy you are to have someone who loves you!' He emphasized the words, someone, and loosing the horse's bridle, Begone! Phoebus spurred on in all haste, swearing. Quasimodo watched him disappear in the shades of the street. Oh, said the poor deaf man, in a very low voice, to refuse that. He re-entered Notre Dame, lighted his lamp, and climbed to the tower again. The gypsy was still in the same place as he had supposed. She flew to meet him, as far off as she could see him. "'Alone!' she cried, clasping her beautiful hands sorrowfully. "'I could not find him,' said Quasimodo coldly. "'You should have waited all night,' she said angrily. He saw her gesture of wrath, and understood the reproach. "'I will lie in wait for him better another time,' he said, dropping his head. "'Be gone,' she said to him. He left her. She was displeased with him. He preferred to have her abuse him rather than to have afflicted her. He had kept all the pain to himself. From that day forth the gypsy no longer saw him. He ceased to come to her cell. 
At the most she occasionally caught a glimpse at the summit of the towers, of the bell-ringer's face turned sadly to her. But as soon as she perceived him he disappeared. We must admit that she was not much grieved by this voluntary absence on the part of the poor hunchback. At the bottom of her heart she was grateful to him for it. Moreover, Quasimodo did not deceive himself on this point. She no longer saw him, but she felt the presence of a good genius about her. Her provisions were replenished by an invisible hand during her slumbers. One morning she found a cage of birds on her window. There was a piece of sculpture above her window which frightened her. She had shown this more than once in Quasimodo's presence. One morning, for all these things happen at night, she no longer saw it. It had been broken. The person who climbed up to that carving must have risked his life. Sometimes in the evening she heard a voice, concealed beneath the windscreen of the bell-tower, singing a sad, strange song as though to lull her to sleep. The lines were unrhymed, such as a deaf person can make. Ne regarde pas la figure, j'en fille regarde le cœur, le cœur d'un beau jeune homme est souvent déformé. Il a des cours au l'amour, ne se conserve pas. J'en fille, le sapin, n'est-ce pas beau? N'est-ce pas beau comme la poupée? Mais il garde son feuillage levé. Et là, et quoi bon dire si l'est, ce qui n'est pas beau à tort d'être. La beauté n'aime que la beauté, avril tourne la douce à janvier. La beauté est parfait, la beauté pour tout. La beauté est la sûre, Chose qui n'existait pas de mi. Le corbeau ne volait que le jour, le hibo ne volait que la nuit, la signe volait la nuit et la jour. Look not at the face, young girl, look at the heart. The heart of a handsome young man is often deformed. There are hearts in which love does not keep. Young girl, the pine is not beautiful, it is not beautiful like the poplar, but it keeps its foliage in winter. Alas, what is the use of saying that, that which is not beautiful has no right to exist? Beauty loves only beauty, April turns her back on January. Beauty is perfect, beauty can do all things, beauty is the only thing which does not exist by halves. The raven flies only by day, the owl flies only by night, the swan flies by day and by night. One morning, on awaking, she saw on her window two vases filled with flowers. One was a very beautiful and very brilliant but cracked vase of glass. It had allowed the water with which it had been filled to escape, and the flowers which it contained were withered. The other was an earthenware pot, coarse and common, but which had preserved all its water, and its flowers remained fresh and crimson. I know not whether it was done intentionally, but La Esmeralda took the faded nosegay and wore it all day long upon her breast. That day she did not hear the voice singing in the tower. She troubled herself very little about it. She passed her days in caressing Jolly in watching the door of the Grand Delorier house, in talking to herself about Phoebus, and in crumbling up her bread for the swallows. She had entirely ceased to see or hear Quasimodo. The poor bell-ringer seemed to have disappeared from the church. One night, nevertheless, when she was not asleep, but was thinking of her handsome captain, she heard something breathing near her cell. She rose in alarm, and saw by the light of the moon a shapeless mass lying across her door on the outside. It was Quasimodo, asleep there, upon the stones. End of Book Nine, Chapter Four